challenges. Today's video conference is the result of a collaborative effort by the Maternal Health Task Force at Harvard, MHTF, and the, the UN Population Fund, UNFPA, and the Wilson Center as part of our Global Health Initiative's out ongoing series, Advancing Policy Dialogue on Maternal Health, made possible by the generous funding of MHTF and UNFPA. And we are pleased to welcome one of our collaborators at UNFPA, Sarah Craven, to today's discussion. She is here, and hopefully uh, she can chime in during the uh, Q&A. Um, I also want to single out my colleagues Sandeep Pathala and Lauren Hertzer of the Wilson Center's Global Health Initiative. They are in New Delhi right now, and they deserve uh, much credit for organizing this event from the Wilson Center's end. I'm speaking of the Global Health Initiative. It will be hosting two upcoming events here at the Wilson Center that may be of interest to this audience. On Thursday, April 18th, from 12 to 2, there will be a discussion on violence against women and maternal health. And on Thursday, May 2nd, from 12 to 2, there will be a discussion on respectful maternal health care. The Wilson Center is thrilled to have partnered with the Population Foundation of India to bring the policy dialogue to a high-level group of policymakers and practitioners in India in a day-long discussion held yesterday in New Delhi. Today's discussion is uh, meant to bring a north-south dimension to the dialogue series and to highlight some of the insights and recommendations that came out of yesterday's meeting. Uh, Poonam Matreja, Executive Director of the Population Foundation of India, will give us uh, some more background on yesterday's meeting in just a few minutes. But first, I'm going to introduce Mary Nell Wegner, Deputy Director of Policy and Technical Support at the Women in Health Initiative in the Harvard School of Public Health, which houses the Maternal Health Task Force. You should have bios of everyone speaking today, uh, so for that reason I won't introduce her formally. Instead, I will turn things over to Mary Nell. So very briefly, Mary, now I've just been given a request from our uh, audio team. If you could have the audio turned up on your side. Sorry about that. <laughs> and go back to Puna.
been to have this collaboration and get input from many of the partners, especially UNSA being based in Delhi. Um, uh, we also are very happy to have colleagues from the uh, centre here with us. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, since you've given a brief background on what happened yesterday in the group here, we going very quickly to 70 leading development practitioners met in Delhi along with senior government officials, donors, and media representatives coming together to participate in the very exciting and the productive dialogue we had yesterday to look at future priorities in maternal health in India. Am I speaking too fast? Not loud enough. Not loud enough. Could you speak up a bit more?
do not get enough adequate care for antenatal and other health care. Let me now share a few points that were made in the plenary session yesterday. Dr. Sikhar, uh, Deputy Commissioner, Family Planning, uh, Division of the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, who represented Anuradha Gupta, who couldn't come, <coughs> drew attention to three key achievements of the government uh, of National Rural Health Mission. One, he drew attention to the latest data from 2011. <coughs> where he estimated that and here i quote the provision of family planning has averted 800000 births a year of which 500000 were <coughs> high risk births he's referring primarily to adolescents where adolescent fertility went down additionally 1700 maternal deaths have been averted per year which is almost half way to the requirement to the requirement of averting 3500 maternal deaths a year in order to reach the mmr of 100 second point he made was that the janani suraksha yojana which i'm going to refer to you as jsy hence for a conditional cash transfer scheme for institutional deliveries to promote safe motherhood was launched in 2005 under the rural health mission um the national rural health mission i'm sorry which i will refer to henceforth as nhrm in their flagship rural health program the number of beneficiaries under jsy has increased 13 times from 750000 in 2005 to nearly 10 million over 5 years however the challenges of early detection of danger signs in mothers and infants inadequate counseling and postpartum continue to remain three the government of india has launched a comprehensive strategy on reproductive maternal newborn child and adolescent health <coughs> which is being called RMNCH plus A this was announced at the call for action in chennai in january 2013 the strategy aims to expand coverage by developing a cohesive approach to women's health in various life stages the strategy and approach are based on the premise that the health of an individual uh, across life stages is interlinked dr srina reddy president of the public health foundation of india emphasized the need to not only focus on maternal mortality but pay equal attention to maternal morbidity for every woman dying in childbirth about 20 suffer long lasting and debilitating illnesses in india many women suffering from these disabilities also undergo several emotional mental and psychological stress while the recent focus on mental health is welcome we are still in the very early stages of thinking about some of these issues the need for morbidity and equity to be included in the post 2015 sustainable development goals was emphasized one way to do this is to promote a life cycle approach that recognizes maternal health reproductive and sexual health and family planning cannot be addressed in isolation and are in in text in extricably linked in the larger health continuum dr geeta sen professor indian institute of management bangalore reiterated the importance of key social determinants such as violence against women early marriage early pregnancy safe abortion sex selection that impact maternal and reproductive health she said it is important to state that women's health is a matter of rights informed choice good health and well being dr shiv kumar advisor unicef and member national advisory council emphasized the importance of situating concerns of maternal health and maternal morbidity within the overall provision of healthcare in the country while supporting the government strategy he called for addressing six deficits if the goals and targets envisioned by the strategy are to be realized first is the accountability deficit the lack of accountability at all levels in government and particularly accountability at the top of 
uh, at the top to outcomes, accountability, and community. Accountability to quality. The second deficit he spoke of is ownership deficit. This derives from the first. No one really wants to accept responsibility for delivering commitment, uh, delivering on commitments. We also find lack of coordination between health, non-health sectors, such as nutrition, water, and sanitation, which also impact health outcomes. Knowledge deficit. Uh, this is reflected in the absence of benchmarks, weak monitoring and evaluation systems, and poor understanding. Competency deficit. This is particularly severe at the level of the state governments and districts. Apart from poor training of doctors and frontline health workers, there is very little competency for managing and analyzing data, planning, undertaking, um, cost-effective studies. Then the trust deficit. The continued distrust among some civil society of the government is neither encouraging nor constructive, given that considerable progress has been achieved under the National Rural Health Mission. Finally, the financial deficit. Needless to say, unless public expenditure on health can be stepped up, we cannot expect rapid gains in maternal <coughs> health and maternal morbidity. Even after the launch of the NRHM, public spending on health has not shown marked increase and has remained around 1.2% of GDP over the past five to seven years, which includes years where economic growth was fairly uh, high. Many of these deficits were addressed by participants in the working groups. The recommendations which will be made this evening will be used at the national, state uh, level to advocate for improved policies, interventions on maternal health in India. I'd like to end by saying that the collective vision emerging from the dialogue is to expand existing frameworks create new paradigms. We want to see a future that views maternal health from the perspective of overall health and well-being, women's empowerment, dignity, rights, justice, our values <coughs> integral to this approach. And now I'm going to, uh, may I now invite my co-panelists to give a brief overview of the recommendations that were made yesterday. Shall we move to that? Okay, I didn't get a note. So, <laughs> uh, we are still with you, okay. So yes, go right ahead. So, Professor Lila Visaria will be our first panelist, or is our first panelist, one of India's leading demo demographers. Uh, is an honorary professor at the Gujarat Institute for Development Studies. Lila has spent many decades researching, writing, uh, writing on issues of demography, health, <coughs> education, family planning is a big focus um, and looking at the demographic transition in India. She's co-authored several books and articles and she's a member of the Population Commission which is chaired and appointed as a member by the Prime Minister of India. Leela, over to you. <coughs> Good morning and good evening to everybody. Um, uh, basically, I moderated one session <coughs> dealing with, uh, dealing with uh, connecting maternal health, reproductive health, and family planning. And uh, a number of suggestions and recommendations emerged <coughs> from that uh, session yesterday. Uh, all were very, each one of them which was very important, but in the interest of time, I'll focus only on a few of them. The first recommendation and concern that emerged was that the current implementation of these various programs related to maternal health, reproductive health, and family planning have become vertical in our country, and there is a very great need to integrate all of them in the broader perspective of women's health. Uh, the integration of maternal health, 
family welfare, maternal health, family welfare as we call it in India, and reproductive health programs and services provide opportunities <coughs> to streamline and improve the reproductive health of women and care given to women. <coughs> in practice, what it means is that offering women a broad set of family planning and reproductive health services and maternal <coughs> health services at the same delivery site and by the same provider improves the health of women to a considerable extent. I think we all know this, and yet we have not been able to achieve this. So that is one of the major concerns that was uh, listed yesterday. The second issue that has been of concern to us is to reposition family planning within the larger maternal health construct. A repositioning of family planning not only helps promoting spacing of births or meeting the unmet need of contraception and also helps in population stabilization to a great extent, uh, but I think we need to position it to position it in the context of improving the health of women and in turn that of children. Uh, evidence that Indian women in core North Indian states do not want several children is well established. The women, young women in the age group 20 to 29, do not desire more than two children. And if that is the case, I think we need to break broad based family planning in the larger maternal health issue. The third concern that we have is that sexual health somehow has by default got dropped from our program. And there are some efforts which are made to provide information on HIV and safe sex to young of our country. But and services but services are almost non existent for adolescents and young people. And if they exist they are rarely responsive to the needs of the youth <coughs> or rarely user-friendly, youth-friendly. And so this is another issue that we think sexual, we believe strongly that the sexual health needs to be brought back to the reproductive health agenda. Uh, in the context of this background or this, these issues which came up yesterday, I think we have Discussed, we discussed also that there is a need to undertake systematic analysis to remove the conceptual separation between the key programs. Uh, understand the related costs if you remove, if you integrate the programs and what the policy risks are. I think we do this kind of an exercise. The rationale for integration is well established. But I think we need to undertake a, some kind of an evaluation and an analysis of this. The second concern that we have is that uh, uh, is related to incentives for family planning program, especially sterilization. Uh, the incentive for contraception in our country was introduced way back in the 1960s essentially to reduce the birth rate, but they have continued in some form or the other even today. And we may view them as compensation for the loss of wages, I mean, but which is a, you know, a different way of saying that we want to offer consent to incentives. But the question is, there are several questions related to that, that when the Total fertility rate in India has come down to 2.4 now nationally, mm -hmm. and about 50% or more than 50% of the pop in population, the TFR has come down to replacement level. Do we still need incentives? I think is a question we need to probe and understand. The second concern that we have articulated is that what is incentivized <coughs> is what is done generally by the health providers, and that is what is measured. 
And I think it's basically the emphasis on sterilization. And so sterilizations get done and sterilization performance gets measured. And I think this is some concern we have and we need to probe into that. The third related concern that we have is that although India has adopted a target-free approach since 1996 or post, in a post-Cairo period, but the target mindset has remained in our country. And it continues, there are several arguments which keep coming up. One is the Malmutian argument, argument which even our ministers often talk about. There is also a fear expressed that India will overtake China, and that, that fear looms very large. Um, it's unavoidable. India will indeed overtake China in the nearby future. The third thing is the population uh, will take longer to stabilize if we don't have incentives and if we don't have targets. And I think this issue needs to be examined more closely. Is that really the case? Uh, the other issue that has been of concern to many of us is the postpartum care, which is practically non-existent. There are lots of studies which have shown that there is a large difference between areas, northern states versus southern states of the country. But in northern states, postpartum care is virtually non-existent. And in that context, to discuss and promote postpartum IUD, I think is something which intrauterine device merits some further discussion, further reflection, and further research. Uh, then there is, of course, a need to focus <coughs> on adolescent health. I did talk about it. There's also a need to enhance male responsibility, not only in family planning, but also in reproductive health. And there is also a need to increase access and quality of abortion services and include medical abortion in the public health system. I think with this one. Thank you very much, Leela. We are going to take questions at the end, but if there is a clarification question, we can take them um, if everybody agrees. Sounds good.
agenda needs to be broadened and expanded from <coughs> only maternal mortality or family planning focus to broader maternal morbidity, women's health, adolescent health, newborn and child health, what, what government of India has called RMNCH plus A agenda, or 20 years ago, and the Cairo conference was called Reproductive Health Agenda. So, so the group which met yesterday was in general very happy about this new development. <coughs> I'm going to report on two groups, one on the social determinants of maternal health, and another on knowledge gaps. The recent Arusha conference on maternal health and the manifesto for maternal health which has come out makes a very important statement. It says, and I quote, <coughs> maternal health will not be improved to its full potential by focusing on maternal health alone. And that precisely is something where social determinants come in. Maternal health Women's health is shaped in the society by several social determinants and our group deliberated and made recommendations on that. So I list only some of the important social determinants and India being so diverse, culturally, socially so rich that it's difficult to really cover the entire uh, map. But some of the important issues, social determinants which you listed one is the social customs, beliefs, and practices. We have enormous number of traditional belief systems and practices. Just to give an example, <coughs> in large part of North India, maybe nearly in half of India, girls are married early. Earlier the marriage, earlier is the first pregnancy, with subsequent all the consequences on maternal <coughs> health and on newborn health as well. Or that women, during pregnancy, cut down their food intake because that is a traditional practice. To avoid a large fetus and difficult delivery, instead of increasing nutrition, they cut down <coughs> their diet. Or the traditional value system, which values male child more and actively discriminates against the girl child to the extent that there is a selective female feticide or sex selective abortion going on with distorted sex ratios at the population level. So various such social customs, beliefs, practices, values enormously shape maternal health and maternal newborn child health. Another issue is nutrition. Apart from poverty and availability of food, various social customs, women's low status in the family so that within the family she gets to eat the food in the end and uh, so nutritional problem result in women with low body mass index. The national survey NFHS nearly eight years ago records that 36% <coughs> of women in India are malnourished. The same survey also records that nearly 55% in India women are anemic. So low body mass index, smaller body size and anemia are the major nutrition deficiencies in India. Violence against girls and women was very much emphasized. Just a few months ago, we had the outrage, national outrage against rape against women, especially the daily episode. And since then, it has become a major issue on the national agenda. But violence against women occurs not only outside, but it also occurs inside the family. Domestic violence also, and uh, there is a lot of violence involved in sexual relationships as well. So that is the third uh, determinant. Political disempowerment of women in Indian society. We have a very sort of paradoxical situation. On one side, women occupy the highest positions of national leadership. President of India was a woman, Speaker of Indian Parliament is a woman, the President of the ruling uh, political party is a woman, and at the same time, there are very few members of Parliament, women members of Parliament. 
there are very few women ministers. So women have much less voice at their decision making levels in government. There have been some positive developments also, but especially at the grassroots, a large number of micro credit and saving groups of women have emerged in India and they have become a major voice of women at the grassroots. In the total body elections, elected women representatives in some states now contribute <coughs> 33 to 50 percent of elected representatives. So they are gradually asserting themselves in the decision making process. But in general, in, in the political arena, women remain disempowered. <coughs> The another major issue mentioned, the recent Global Burden Disease of Disease Study published in the Lancet <coughs> lists three major risk factors affecting health, and including especially for South Asia and India. They list the indoor air pollution from cooking stoves, second, alcohol, and third, tobacco. <coughs> Indoor pollution because of cooking stoves, mainly women are exposed during cooking and they badly suffer. Alcohol, few women in India consume alcohol, but most of them are victims of alcohol consumption by men in the form of violence, in the form of abuse, in the form of loss of family income. And so, alcohol and movement against alcohol has been a major rallying point of women's movement in India in last <coughs> few years. Tobacco is another major risk factor. Women in India don't smoke much, but a large number of them, in some local studies, nearly 60% of them use oral chewable tobacco. And they suffer because of that effects. One study recently done in a place where I work, Garchi Roli, found that families spend more money on tobacco than government spends on health care as well as nutrition program in the district. So tobacco is a major drain, health drain, drain on health as well as on family finance. Now the recommendations made by this group on social determinants, just to mention few, there is a need for social anthropological studies around gender, rights and equity. For example, what happens in home delivery? What happens in sex selective abortion? Who makes decision? How are women coerced into that? What happens to newborn care at the family level? So all these issues need much more in-depth sociological and anthropological studies. Information is power. And there is a there is a lack of sex specific information about status of women of girls at, for the various level of decision making. Such sex specific information would enormously help in planning, prioritization, resource allocation, as well as monitoring. So that kind of information needs to be generated. Girls education till 10th standard of school must be made mandatory. Currently, it is 8th standard. We would like it to be raised to 10th standard, which would naturally have several consequences on women's employment, women's age of marriage being advanced, <coughs> and women's voice being heard more. One recommendation <coughs> is that correct community level health care provided by the government health care departments, connect that with women's group at the grassroots, especially the micro credit and saving group and the local body women's representatives, then they can seek accountability from the healthcare services uh, depending on what their women need. Operationalize rapid healthcare response for women affected by violence. The daily rape episode show that the girl who was who was raped and uh, subjected to violence for several hours she kept on waiting on the roadside, didn't receive health care. Sensitizing men on maternal health and gender issues, obvious. Mental health services for women, 
especially issues like depression, <coughs> postpartum depression, and tobacco addiction, we may need me mental health services. And the last recommendation of the group, and very interestingly, Puna mentioned about universal health care and new developments in India. Now, government of India has not been able to move ahead because of resource crunch on universal health care. The group recommended that if, if there is a resource crunch, at least begin with universal health care for those who are most vulnerable and needy, and that is men, uh, RMNCH, reproductive health, maternal health, newborn child health, and adolescent health. Some of the issues discussed for knowledge gaps and research agenda, I'll quickly list. Obviously, literature reviews, including on information available on perinatal mortality and maternal morbidity in India. There aren't many studies. More robust methodologies have to be devised on studies for maternal morbidity. What to include, what is the definition, how to measure, National level studies on maternal mortality and morbidities are needed. We currently have only few micro level studies on morbidity. Though we have mortality data, but very very little on morbidity data. We need national level burden of maternal morbidity. Quality of data collected through regular health information system of the health department needs to be improved. What is monitored gets done. So if women's health indicators are more introduced and monitored better, hopefully more healthcare and better healthcare will be delivered. Use of real-time data for planning, obviously, otherwise today we have seven or eight years old data to be used for national planning. And finally, our group suggested that the research fund on RMNCH or maternal health should focus more on the commoner problems, major which cause major burden to women, such problems should be given higher priorities, such as infections in women and reproductive tract infections, RTI, maternal anemia or anemia in women, depression and addiction, and violence against women. These more common issues need more funds allocation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abhay. Thank you, Abhay. I'm going to move to uh, Dr. Sudarshan, who's responsible for innovations in the field of public health in India. Uh, uh, Dr. Sudarshan is founder of the Karuna Trust, which, uh, uh, which is well known for its innovations and investments in public health through public private partnerships. In Karuna Trust runs 68 primary health care centers across eight states. And Dr. Sudarshan has worked extensively on issues of accountability, uh, transparency, <coughs> community participation. In fact, he's a member of the advisory group on community action and is uh, a part of the standing committee constituted by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, uh, which is mandated to spearhead community monitoring programs in India uh, for the NRHM. And most importantly, I think he takes great pride in having been a very powerful and effective ombudsman in the, for the government of Karnataka's health department. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I will be talking about quality of maternal health care and also about the accountability mechanisms for better maternal health. Uh, quality maternal health care is very important at this stage in India. We, through the NRHM, uh, we achieved a lot of uh, um, developments in terms of facilities, the equipment, supplies, and we all, this growth increased. But the quality care is still, uh, we have a long way to go. Um, there's also the, with the institutional deliveries, large number of people are seeking, coming to the institutions, and we don't have quality standards there. So. Quality needs to be prioritized, and we have to introduce systems of uh, quality um, assurance and quality accreditation systems to improve the quality uh, in, in our facilities. Now, we need to develop guidelines, protocols, <coughs> standard treatment protocols, and uh, standard treatment guidelines, checklists. 
We need to put it both for the public and the private. The private accountability is also very important. Uh, only in few states we have the uh, private health establishment bill and act to bring in quality standards there. So we need to uh, the process and outcome in the details. And uh, the, we also need to include the community perspective on quality. Now, um, the, we also need to have quality assurance mechanisms to, to, to be studied, established, including periodic assessments by external team and in facility quality assurance committees. Reforming human resources, especially empowering nurse and midwifery cadre, is of utmost importance. Well, coming to accountability, um, I think in Indian context, it's the most important greatest problem today for healthcare services is the corruption in the system. Though the country has made some progress, there is greater awareness about corruption in all over the country. Um, the judiciary system, the activists have made it much more, created greater awareness, and there are also public actions and movements in the country. Um, there are few efforts to bring in e-procurement and e-governance, but much more needs to be done in terms of transparency and accountability mechanisms. <coughs> The bad management or corruption affects the mainly uh, the, uh, the, the poor and the maternal health. Um, it may be procurement of equipment and rights and resources. Um, I can just quote here the procurement. Uh, I know anemia is a major problem in India, and uh, the federal government, central government here, could not procure IFA tablets, iron folic acid tablets, and almost some of the states did not have. A, iron folic acid for two years. I call it the national shame that we <coughs> have procured and supplied a few paise worth of uh, uh, iron folic acid for losing the anemia. Um, we also have corruption in the hospitals, payments to be made for various services, for antenatal care, or for the childbirth, normal delivery to show the baby to the siblings waiting outside, very common phenomenon, 200 rupees. For a female baby and 250 rupees for male baby. Female babies are cheaper. Um, these are some of the, and then even in for emergency city care, the out-of-pocket expenditure has been very high. So the we also the uh, this accountability has to be at various level. We also have the problem of accountability of the policy makers and the 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 uh, the planners. Just to quote an example. In the origin, we proved that we will move towards uh, institutional deliveries. We thought overnight we can move and there's no need to address the home delivery uh, in these areas. So um, what we are finding now, even after seven years of NRHM, is there are pockets in India where more than 50% of the deliveries are still uh, in the in home deliveries. So we should have, probably when we planned, we should have, this transition was important and we should have planned for the transition of home deliveries to institutional deliveries. So we need to make accountable whoever can or influence the policy of overnight having institutional deliveries all over the country is one such example. We also need to do something for the health system accountability, um, especially administrative reforms. There's a lot of uh, uh, problems in the transparency and accountability so human resource procurement also. Um, in the procurement of equipment and drugs. So uh, for the human resources, Karnataka <coughs> state has made a very progressive transfer policy. A lot of corruption happens when the health personnel are transferred from one place to the other. So how to have an act and uh, go through counseling, some of these reforms are instead reforms can bring down corruption in the system. There's also um, in the procurement, uh, the integrity fact of the Transparency International has been tried out in a few states, especially in Karnataka, whereby uh, having an integrity fact with the manufacturers of drugs and equipment, we can um, bring down costs of procurement. So many such good examples are there. And the third most important is the community monitoring mechanism. The advisory group of community action, a uh, wing of the NRHM, um, has made pilot in nine states uh, in the country, and then we are shown the way. Now the states are taking it up, scaling it up to the rest of the um, state. And I think community planning and monitoring to at least 
minimize the, the accountability me mechanisms, the corruption at the grassroots level can be uh, eliminated or at least reduced. Um, so need to, but unfortunately, the, the whole uh, community monitoring mechanism is not enough. The, the budgets, this year budget cuts are there and the community monitoring has been uh, ignored. We need to prioritize and allocate budgets which are needed for that. And we should be living centers of protection at the, uh, at the lower levels of the, uh, at the community levels. And we are suggesting that a district level ombudsman of person for grievance redressal mechanism uh, is very important. So these were some of the recommendations which were um, um, made by the group. But I want to conclude that uh, mere technological packages of WHO, UNICEF, World Bank, all of that uh, can give us one to two percent better health outcomes. But if we have good governance, um, we can have quite a jump in the health outcomes in India, in Indian countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudarshan. Uh, I cannot believe that we have finished talk on time. It's 7.40 in India. And that's the time we have on the program uh, discussing this council. This is truly historical. John <laughs> 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 Thompson and Mary Regna over to you for discussing comments. Who is introducing? Are you being introduced? Yes, yeah, so I can take it from here. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Poonam. Uh, th and thank you to the, to the three panelists. As you said, we, they were uh, not only great presentations, but very concise to allow us to be on time. So a lot of history being made uh, here today. Um, well, these presentations have set up, I think, some fodder for some really great discussion. Um, and we will get to questions from the audience shortly. But as Poonam said, we do want to uh, give an opportunity to our two discussants to weigh in. Uh, and the first one we'll be hearing from is John Townsend, who is here in Washington uh, with me. John is the um, uh, Vice President and Director of the Population Council's Reproductive Health Program, and he's responsible for overseeing the Council's contraceptive product development, as well as the design and implementation of strategies to promote better reproductive health and family planning programs worldwide. So he's a very logical person uh, to call on here. So John? Uh, great, thank you, Michael. First, I'd like to uh, to acknowledge that we've established a memorial for uh, for the timing of this meeting. Uh, it's out in the hallway and will be inaugurated shortly. Uh, I I lived in India between '93 and '98 and and had the pleasure before working with Mary Nell and Poonam, uh, Leela Abe and and Sudarshan uh, during that time. I don't think we could get a better analysis. Uh, I I think the analysis was spot on. The problems of, of maternal health and indeed the problems of development of India haven't been about around analysis. They've been about implementation, uh, supervision, uh, accountability, and governance. Uh, the, the analysis was remarkable. And I'd like to, before commenting on, on, on India, I'd like to just put this in context. The United States experienced an increase in maternal deaths uh, during the last uh, 20 years uh, from a maternal mortality rate from 12 to around 21. The city of New York, which uh, has some of the best hospitals and facilities in the world, uh, uh, also increased, not unsurprisingly, but what was most shocking is uh, the, the, the maternal deaths among Latinas and Asians was six times that of, uh, of, of, of white women in New York and among uh, black uh, women in New York City. Uh, of, of all wealth quintiles, it was a ten, tenfold difference. So, this country has uh, little to say in some ways uh, uh, to India about uh, improvements in health care. Um, let me just put some of this in context. 20 percent of the deaths around the maternal deaths around the world uh, happen uh, in India. Uh, in terms of total deaths in India, it's, it's still relatively small. It's 50,000 50, a year, more or less. Um, but 20 percent is, is significant, and it's somewhat like polio. There's reservoirs of traditional uh, health consequences that uh, India is, 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 is facing the challenge of eradicating. Um, there are five main issues, I think, to consider when uh, we think about this analysis. The first is the scale. While we can say that, uh, that we, should, we should get rid of these 50,000 deaths, uh, there are 27 million births annually in India. Uh, 
42 percent of the population lives on less than $100.25 a day. Uh, 2.4 million women uh, are, uh, men and women are living with HIV. Uh, many uh, uh, are undiagnosed, uh, and that has consequences later on uh, for, uh, uh, for both the concomitant contributing factors uh, and, uh, and actions that are required. Uh, a one in uh, 140 uh, uh, risk of dying during, during childbirth. While the total number of births has come down dramatically in the last 20 years, uh, that still is significant. So first is scale. How do we deal at this scale? Health is essentially a state issue, not a federal issue. Ideas that are at the federal level and national level somehow have to get down to states and districts uh, where implementation is critical. The second issue besides scale, which India is, is, is really well prepared, I think, to deal with in general, is diversity and equity. And I think the, the analysts have, have highlighted this dramatically. The legacy of caste and class uh, system uh, uh, just reminds us of the problems of uh, providing services to those people who are uh, Dalits, uh, scheduled castes, uh, several tribes. Uh, these are the last people that are, that are served. These are the last per people who have access to, to, to care. Um, uh, um, and this inequity uh, uh, will be a problem for universal health care. It's a problem for every element of, uh, of society. Having said that, um, you know, there's been dramatic uh, uh, improvements in uh, reductions in poverty over the last several years. There's been increases uh, in economic uh, uh, growth of India. Um, uh, in terms of, of uh, the, the Gini index, in terms of distribution, there's only been a modest 3% uh, point uh, increase in, in inequity uh, in income distribution. Uh, India, in fact, looks pretty similar to Indonesia and Japan in terms of how, how family uh, income is distributed. So that's an issue that, that is still a conundrum. So uh, uh, 76 in the world. Uh, in terms of Gini index. Uh, there are many places in Latin America with much lower uh, maternal mortality ratios uh, with uh, much more inequitable uh, income. So it doesn't seem to be really an income issue per se. The third point that was mentioned uh, eloquently by almost all the, uh, the presenters has to do with kind of the weak health infrastructure, uh, particularly in the poorest states, and issues of uh, accountability around implementation of what, are, what we now know as best practices. This has been referred to at times as governance, good governance, or accountability. Uh, and so on. Health is a state issue. Uh, while the federal, uh, uh, while investments in health may be one point, uh, what was it, Punam 1.2 percentage points or something of GDP, uh, states uh, spend their money on health the way they'd like to. It may be ambulances uh, that are used as private vehicles. It may be, uh, it may be on th things that are not health priorities. Uh, traditionally, uh, district hospitals have been low on the investment uh, chain. They, they haven't had the, the development of, uh, of strong uh, maternal health services. Uh, traditionally, births happened at home. Uh, that was perfectly fine for a system that didn't, that didn't have enough human resources to, it, to attend births. I think the, the rapid increase with JSY program has, has led to both an overwhelming of many hospitals uh, and a focus on those payment transactions that, that determine why people come. Uh, if we got rid of the incentives, the question is, are people convinced that health care facilities is better? Uh, are the outcomes uh, desirable in the, in, in, uh, are we seeing desirable outcomes in the long run? Uh, what happens to private health care providers, including midwives in, in local communities that were providing perfectly good care to most women? Um, Quality, I think uh, Sudarshan mentioned that a, a lot. I think quality is, is a, an issue that, that has always come second in the Indian policy context at the state. It was always coverage first, uh, getting the finances second, uh, and then we'll worry about quality when, when it gets there, in part because quality can be, uh, appear intractable. But morbidity now is the biggest issue. Uh, morbidity is important not only because it's a 10 to 12 or 20 fold uh, uh, problem relative to maternal deaths, uh, it also is one of the leading uh, determinants of movement into poverty. So if, if families are investing in women, 
uh, to deal with the morbidities, they're the ones that are moving into uh, uh, increased poverty status. Uh, if they aren't investing in women, it means that women are dying after they leave the hospital and there's little record of actually what happens. It means that uh, in, uh, systems like, uh, like dowry and others where if a woman dies, uh, the man marries again and gets a dowry from a, a second wife, uh, there are lots of incentives for figuring out how do we invest in, in, in the morbidities that we're seeing, and this will be a big issue both for families and for policymakers. Uh, corruption that was been mentioned and the Lester Coutinho from, uh, from from the Packard Foundation has always talked about the biggest source of corruption isn't in purchases and so on, it's not showing up for work. Uh, and, and that's a problem when you're pushing people into facilities and the systems of, of reward and, and, and supervision of people coming to work and doing the, the job at the standard required uh, is a big issue. The fourth uh, theme is the concomitant issues. Uh, we didn't hear much about unsafe abortion. But we know that globally 12% of maternal deaths are due to unsafe abortion. India is a place where abortion is legal. But, f but frankly, most of the abortions occur with unskilled providers in unsanctioned places with techniques that would, uh, would scare the daylights out of, uh, of most people, women in developing countries. Uh, uh, we didn't talk much about that. That is an issue that has to be addressed. In addition, up to maybe 16% of deaths worldwide are, are so directly associated with HIV. And while, while the, the, the rates are relatively low uh, in, in India, the numbers that may be contributing to maternal deaths is something that we should look much closer at. Uh, the status of women has been mentioned in the Human Development Report. Uh, uh, the Gender uh, Inequality Index is uh, 0.62 is relatively high in terms of inequalities that relates to outcomes of reproductive health, empowerment, and labor force participation. Uh, this is 16, 15% lower uh, than, than the rates in Indonesia and Japan, where we found relative equity in terms of income, but, but less uh, uh, equity in terms of uh, uh, women's status. And the fact that 40% of women are, are still uh, married under 18 means that issues of informed consent, uh, being prepared uh, for, for pregnancy and childbirth, dealing with those issues of anemia that have direct consequences for maternal deaths means that many more younger women are dying than, uh, than multiparous women. Uh, I think we've, we've, there are positive models in the, in the region, uh, within India and in the region, and it's a question of figuring out how actually we implement those in those states that are particularly behind. The last issue that's been mentioned is really about weak information systems and the ability to use information. I think Sudarshan talked about, uh, uh, and I think Abe also talked about using in, the community using information for accountability, public health decision makers uh, uh, using information to decide where investment should go. This is clearly an issue that's been a, a problem around morbidities and mortality because their numbers are relatively low compared to malaria or dengue or other, uh, other uh, potential investments. Uh, we need to refine and make simpler our information systems so that people can, uh, can make those decisions based and focus on investing in high impact practices. Uh, I, I think Abe mentioned the Manifesto of Maternal Health post-2016. It was in the Lancet in February 2013. It's an excellent uh, uh, re set of recommendations globally from the Arusha, Arusha Conference, uh, and I would recommend it highly to all those who are interested in, in maternal health, not only in India, but elsewhere. Uh, thank you again for an extraordinary analysis. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you uh, all doing this work still. Thank you. And thank you, uh, John, for that uh, excellent intervention, filling in some, some uh, important gaps. Let's now go to our second discussant, uh, Mary uh, Nero Wagner, back at uh, Harvard. Mary Nell? Thanks, Michael. And thank you, John. I've learned there's no fate worse Townsend as a moderator. <laughs> so let me see what I can do to fill in a little bit around the edges. As he noted, the U.S. has some striking discrepancies and some shameful numbers as we look at our own maternal mortality figures. So it's with a fair amount of humility that we have any recommendations to offer you. I fear we have few models that are really worth following. And even if in India, as you mentioned, Poonam, universal health coverage is beyond reach this year, it sounds like there is still plenty to work on and plenty to do. 
As both Drs. Visaya and Bong noted, there is increased emphasis on reaching a broader spectrum of care, and I find that especially interesting. I think having had a conversation with you, Dr. Vasaria, maybe 20 years ago about family planning and young people. So it's really heartening to see that now there is this evolution to RMNCH plus A. And my plea for all of us is that we don't just change letters on documents, so that we have a longer string, but that we truly work on figuring out what that means and how we actually improve access across that spectrum of care. As I was thinking about the five key issues that John mentioned, as well as the wise words from all of you summarizing the highlights of the discussions you've had for two days, I kept circling back to the plight of the tribal woman that Puna mentioned in her introduction. And I think it might be useful to focus on her. In your country, like in our country, rural health care and urban health care look quite different. And there's a whole complexity of social determinants, as Abe noted, that make those complexities even more complicated. So what could we do to change the odds for her? Maybe it's integration. Maybe if we can figure out how to reach her with one point of contact in some health system, we really could address a multiplicity of needs. Maybe we could catch her before she even thought of getting pregnant. Maybe we could help her nutritionally. Maybe we could help her with relationships in her lives. Maybe we can help her to make sure that the men she interacts with are supportive of her health and her reproductive choices, as well as educational opportunities and economic opportunities. But if she has this one point of contact with the health system, what can we truly do for her and ultimately her newborn? I was struck by the comment that if only what health care providers do is what gets measured, how does she fit into that? We know she's not regularly getting health care. We know she may not be getting health care at all. And if we're only looking at what a provider's doing in a facility setting, we're never going to count her. In fact, we may never see her until we can actually get her in. So how can we involve the community? How can we breed trust to help her understand that there may be something that an organized healthcare system can do for her? Whatever we do, let's make sure we figure out how to interact with her so that she becomes part of the equation, ideally all the way through postpartum care, and that she gets counted. Hmm. In Karnataka, as was mentioned, there are, there are real discrepancies in pockets of care, and as I noted, very similarly to our country. And if there are community monitoring mechanisms for accountability, what might those look like? Our own work in Karnataka has shown us how different the North is from the South when you look at numbers. But how can we understand better how to address those differences? whether it's in Karnataka or someplace else in the world with similar discrepancies. As we think about interesting and innovative new mechanisms to reach women, one issue I was waiting to hear about, and I'm curious about whether it was discussed, is mHealth. Are there any mobile technologies that you're finding in an Indian context that are proving to be especially applicable or even relevant yeah. to the situation of women, of all women, there. I also think, and, and perhaps it's Dita Sen we can, we can thank for this quote, all of, this, all of these ideas lead us back to an overarching notion of how we might be accountable to quality. As was noted, we recently held, together with Management and Development for Health in Tanzania, a conference that brought together over 750 experts in maternal health and allied fields, and that was about quality of care. And we realized at the end of those three days, we could keep talking for decades. 
And although we'd like to have the opportunity to keep talking for decades about quality of maternal health care, now's the time for action. So I guess I want to end by saying, so what's next? What kind of action can we all take? And what will make a difference not only for us, but for a tribal woman, wherever she may be, in a little pocket of India? Hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mary Nell, and, and to John as well. Two really interesting uh, contributions. Um, well, I'd like to, before we get to questions, I'd like to turn things back to Poonam and ask you, Poonam, and your uh, co-panelists there in New Delhi, uh, if you'd like to respond to, uh, to the very good points that uh, our two discussants made. In particular, there was one, among others, that really stood out for me, particularly as I was going to ask a question along these lines, is this rural versus urban divide? Uh, we've heard a lot about this. Uh, are there more challenges in the, in the rural setting uh, than, than in the urban one in this context with maternal health uh, care provision. So I turn things back to you, Poonam. Okay. Um, would anybody on the panel or in the group present here, we have a very experienced group with us. Would anyone like to answer? Who would like to answer that question? Panelists or anybody else there? Okay. Dr. Sebastian. Uh, the National Rural Health Mission, the focus was on rural uh, health, but um, the urban health, there was supposed to be a separate uh, um, urban health mission, but now the present status is that both rural and urban will be combined. It will be called National, uh, National Health Mission, which will take care of the both urban and rural. Now, urban health, the, the status of the health of the urban poor is worse than the rural poor. So we need to understand, the, especially the slums in the urban area. So the, there is no primary health care system in the, for the urban poor. So the ur, urban primary health care system is very, very important. And that has been now accepted, and uh, funds have also been allotted for taking the urban health care in India. That's the present status. <coughs> Anybody else? Yeah. This, uh, uh, Let just come here. You'll have to come here. Well, how, what, how does it work? Thank you. No, I just wanted to add uh, the dimension of the social determinants that we've talked about in the context of urban health. Um, I think um, there are lots of problems of congestion and lack of um, safe sanitation and uh, water and hygiene facilities, which also complicates the context of maternal and reproductive sexual health for women in urban India. Uh, just to extend uh, what uh, Dr. Sudarshan had said, he had talked about the lack of access to facilities and much of the care in urban, even in rural, uh, for rural women, but much more for urban women is in the, uh, is in, pr in the private sector, very unregulated and very diverse and heterogeneous in uh, provision of healthcare. Thank you, Priya. Oh. If it's okay, Poonam, I think what we'll do now, uh, unless the, uh, any of the panelists wanted to weigh in on, on what the two discussants had to say, I say that we start just opening things up to, uh, to all of our uh, audiences. And what I would propose is that... Uh, that would be terrific. I okay. Think. Okay, so what I'd propose is that, uh, I mean, since we're making such good time, uh, we could take some questions from, uh, from each audience in each city, and I uh, think we could start here in, uh, in Washington, then I'll move over to, uh, to Harvard and then back to, uh, to New Delhi. Um, just a, a reminder, uh, at least this goes for here at, at the Wilson Center, uh, please wait until you have a microphone in front of you before you ask your question, and keep it brief, and please let it be one question. Um, and uh, so what I'll do is take... Um, 
four que uh, four questions consecutively. So if the panelists could hold off until all four questions are posed, then they could all be answered, and then we'll move on to uh, to uh, Harvard. So we'll start with the woman right there in the orange. Thank you, and please identify yourself. Woman in orange is Jill Gay. What works for women? Org. And my question is to follow up to John Townsend's comment. We can't hear you. You make sure the mic is on. It should be. <laughs> We can. Oh, uh, it was actually a faulty mic, uh, and we've ha we have a replacement though. So just uh, stand by for about three seconds. Hi. So the woman. Thank you. So the woman in orange is Jill Gay. What works for women. Org. And I wanted to follow up on John Townsend's um, comments on abortion, and. In India, where abortion is legal, do women have any knowledge that it's legal? Where to go? Are there any trained providers? Um, and what is the possibility of for scale up of this of uh, Dr. Bang's model uh, of community based postpartum care? Okay, and uh, let's uh, uh, take the question right over here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Indira Narayanan, uh, consultant to Newborn Health. Um, I would like to uh, congratulate the speakers. This was one of the nicest symposiums that I've attended. We can't hear, we can't see you, help no. us. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with you. Uh, I'm Indira Narayanan, a consultant uh, in newborn health. I'd like to congratulate all the speakers and moderators. It was one of the nicest panel discussion uh, I've attended, and it was very, very useful. I particularly want to thank Mary Nell uh, Wegner for having mentioned newborn health. I'm afraid always in your RMNCH and plus A component, the little newborn is the one that tends to slip through. Uh, newborn health, I think, should be a part of maternal health always, because besides improving newborn health and survival, it will contribute to promotion of family planning acceptance and will also improve maternal health and well-being. Thank you. Okay, next we're going to take a question. There's one on this side of the room, uh, a woman in the, uh, in the green shirt. I think it's a green shirt. Hi, I'm Jordan Teague from WASH Advocates, and I was very pleased to hear uh, water and sanitation mentioned at least a couple times from the panelists and um, those answering questions. I just kind of want to explore that further um, and wonder if you have any suggestions for integrating water and sanitation infrastructure and services into uh, maternal health to decrease the maternal mortality and also the newborn and child health. Okay, and the, the other question, I think it was the first one. I'm sorry I can't pick on everyone, but in the interest of time, yes, right. Uh, my name is uh, Francoise Risa Kayuzia, Action for Reproductive Health, and I'm from Uganda. Um, yes. Um, what I have heard from the panelists from India is exactly like that of Uganda, except like for us, we have 16 mothers dying every day in child labor and disabilities of about like 345 per thousand. So I think we are worse off than them. Um, they talked about, uh, two of them, one talked about malnutrition as a, a contributing factor for the mat uh, matano, poor maternal health outcome. And I also heard uh, that the government, or rather Minister of Health in India, does not sometimes fail to provide a folic acid for these mothers. Uh, at the end of the day, they end up with uh, anemia. I just wanted to find out whether uh, they have tried 
I introducing or like working with with the with the nutritionists because at the end of the day if you can't have if you can't have folic acid at least there has to be some food that's going to to bring up the 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 blood level of these mothers do have they tried to work with the nutritionists to see whether they can improve Okay, thank you. Uh, well, John, at least one of those questions is directed to you, so do you want to weigh in and then we could open it up to uh, everyone? I'd give the, 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 the word to, uh, to Delhi. I, I, it was the question around uh, abortion. I mean, abortion clearly is legal f f for 30 years or more in India. Uh, what all the surveys indicate is that women uh, and men indeed don't know that it's legal. Uh, uh, there is a system for accreditation of uh, both providers and sites. Uh, uh, oftentimes, uh, where there's a skilled provider, the site hasn't been accredited. Uh, where there's a accredited site, there often isn't a skilled provider. It's the, the classic conundrum of, of, of en engaging in complex services. And all too often, I think, uh, as it relates to now self-selection, uh, uh, sex-selective abortion, the, the oversight is on that element and not overall quality. And so uh, essentially the focus of this service, uh, which is legal and demanded in India, uh, is, is lost and its link to maternal deaths and morbidity is, is, is often ignored. Okay, let's go to New Delhi. Poonam, did your, do you or your panelists uh, want to weigh in now? Simply to be where people who know them. So, um, 
making abortion safer or more accessible is actually a pretty serious and complex problem in our context. Anyone else want to respond to the questions from Washington? No, there are still, we have, yeah, yeah, we have a few more questions quickly to respond. The, there was a comment from Indira uh, Nariman and on that newborn um, gap that uh, often fall through the, fall, has fallen in many parts of the world and initially in India through the cracks, but with Abebas, ACMC model, which has been scaled up in India, the home-based, home-based neonatal care program that has been scaled up in India and many other parts of Africa, um, I think uh, is a significant contribution. Do you want to say something about that, Abe? Yeah, I, I tried to address the question. The question asked was, what is the possibility of scaling up this home-based care model in India? Now, I will address this in two parts. First is the home-based newborn care model developed in Garchiroli has now become part of the national program and 800,000 community health workers in villages in India, they are called ASHA. So ASHAs are being trained to deliver home-based newborn care nearly to 20 million neonates born in rural area every year. The training manual, training content, training of trainers over. NRHM, National Rural Health Mission, has also approved incentive money for home-based newborn care being provided by ASHA. And so, rapid scale-up is occurring. There are, of course, several operational issues, issues of supervision, issues of quality, issues of timeliness, etc., which need to be addressed. And we should be paying attention to so that the home-based newborn care, when it is scaled up and reaches everywhere, it should have an impact. But for that, one thing would be very necessary. But to come to the other part, you asked me what is the possibility of home-based postpartum care. And anticipating this question 10 years ago, <laughs> we started working in Garichiroli on home-based maternal morbidity. And monitoring first the home-based or uh, the maternal morbidity in villages, we published that 43% of women in rural areas, only girls, suffer one or other postpartum morbidity. And then we have developed now with the support of MacArthur Foundation, we have developed home-based maternal care model for the postpartum care, not for delivery, but for the home-based postpartum care. And that also has shown, and I am not going to preempt or announce results, but that has shown in a controlled field trial, deep reduction in maternal morbidity. So it seems that we can very easily now add home-based maternal care or postpartum care to home-based newborn care, and both can be delivered through ASHA. The latter part, home-based maternal care, but we'll need now a lot of advocacy and uh, incorporation, efforts to incorporate that as a national program. Um, we have a question from Bharati on integrating water and sanitation to maternal and child health. The only attempt that has been made is to set up village health and, and sanitation committees uh, at the village level to bring in greater integration. Has that brought integration? Um, we don't have evidence. Uh, I believe, and at the grassroots level and at that community, uh, 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 level, there is meetings, but uh, getting collaboration between different ministries is very difficult and a challenge and continues to be a challenge. And I don't believe, is there anybody in the room who wants to respond to this? Is there any evidence to show otherwise? Overwhelmingly low. So I'm going to move to. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say there was a. a there was a review by Anupa Jain recently published from the Asia Development Bank that, that looked at, I think, uh, at a level of about 3 
uh, reduction, potential reduction in maternal deaths due to improved water and sanitation. We also know that having water closer means that women have to carry water less. Uh, it frees their time. It allows them to spend more time on their own health, the health of their children, and economic activities, which are which are part and parcel of a, a women in health uh, agenda. So I think uh, you know there are lots of things that are integrated here, and we have to think about it holistically. I think. I'd like to. Uh Okay. On malnutrition, which uh, and folic acid, which I'm going to quickly ask Dr. Sudarshan to answer. Yeah, the, the issue was, uh, I mean, the idea of substitute for high folic acid is the uh, uh, impact to the better nutrition. But I wish that comes through. But uh, it, it, if you are unable to procure an IFK tablet, it costs less than a cent. And it's a bad management uh, mechanism for procurement and distribution. So the, the federal government could not do, they transferred it to the states. Some of the well-managed states like southern states, they could procure it and distribute. But the, the problem was bad, uh, the, way the, the, the demand state, the empowered states could not procure and they said. So now, again, the uh, government is thinking of essentially procuring for the, uh, the poorer states, the uh, very demanded states. So those who not have capability to procure it. So major, what I was stressing is on the capacity of the procurement and distribution, a simple management uh, tool which needs to be, not the lack of money or any of those things. That was my point. Okay. If I... Uh, there is one more response from Dr. Mm -hmm. Sanjay Hazarika. Um, go ahead, Sanjay. You have to come here. Dr. Sanjay Hazarika runs a very innovative program uh, in Marjuri in the Northeast uh, where uh, he reaches the most unreachable through both clinics. Um, uh, these are inaccessible places. Um, actually, I have a set of points. One is that, uh, obviously, from what we've heard from each other, one size does not fit all. Mm. Yeah. And the tribals of Vatroli are not the tribals right. of the Northeast. Because the tribals of the Northeast are in power in their states. So I would uh, caution uh, any assumption that uh, the tribals are one particular entity. That's one thing. The second thing is that I come from a state SM where, which has the worst maternal mortality rate in the country. It's uh, 381. But it was 490 six years ago. So there is a dramatic improvement, but we're still at the bottom. Now, one of the reasons we need to look at, understand this, is that these are areas also of conflict. And nobody in this group or in your, uh, in any of these areas, in these discussions, has raised the issue that conflict means services are not delivered. Violence engenders fear, fear, hatred, bloodshed, that cycle ensures that uh, these problems are not resolved, certainly, and that they're not uh, even handled uh, well. Uh, I would just make uh, two other uh, quick points. Is that the role of the media in dissemination needs also to be reviewed in some of these areas and some of the issues. Um, because uh, without alliances with media, you're not going to be able to really spread the word. And new media is a critical uh, tool in, in this. Uh, the last point is one that has come up time and again, which is the need for counseling. You know, in areas of conflict, in addition to the trauma that people go through in terms of conflict that they face, there is the need for women to have access to counselors, just to, to talk. And even this, on a normal basis, is just not available. So I would say that uh, there are a huge number of gaps which need to be linked and frankly Working with the government is a nightmare. So, <laughs> you know, the government, but maybe they're in the audience somewhere, but 
you know, it is extremely <laughs> tough. We can see the four clinics, we run them, the fungus, but uh, it's really a pain. So, you know, at some point, some of us will say this far and no further. We don't want anything more to do with this. We'll, we'll uh, because we want to reverse, give you a different perspective. You are really dealing with communities who are geography, geographically and socially excluded. They have no access to anything. Education, health, the world. Well, I'd like to uh, go to Boston. Yes, thank you. I'd like to go to Boston and give uh, Mary Nell an opportunity to call on some questions from her audience. Mary Nell, would you like to do that? Thank you, Michael. We have, we have a question right here in the front row. Good morning and good evening. Um, I'm Tamil Kendall. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow with the Women in Health Initiative here. And um, both the, the panelists and the discussants brought up the issue of the challenges presented by decentralization for accountability and also the promise of community monitoring and women's, particularly women's groups involvement in that community monitoring to improve accountability and transparency. And so I'd like to hear from you a bit more about the mechanisms, how those community monitoring groups are functioning, but also if there is a report back um, that involves the federal level or the national scene that's involved, that links the community with the state and then with the federal level. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mary Wanika Sando, um, and I'm a student here um, doing my master's in public health. Um, so I have a question uh, with regards to healthcare, uh, human resource for healthcare. I'm from Tanzania, and we are faced with very similar uh, challenges of having skilled healthcare workers um, for the population. And so my question is: Is is it only that the ratio between trained healthcare workers and the population that they need to serve is very big, but also the, the distribution of the skilled healthcare workers and what is the plan. Um, I think it was mentioned that apart from um, from the gap of having skilled healthcare workers, but uh, the competencies of the doctors, is there, I mean, what's the forward plan apart from increasing maybe outputs of trained um, healthcare workers? Um, what's the plan with um, supervision, mentorship, etc.? <coughs> Thank you, Mary. Are there other questions at our end? So now let's go. Let's go over back to you. And I can paraphrase okay. those questions. I don't know how the audio feed was at your end. Just a question about the women's groups. The women's groups. Decentralization, accountability, community monitoring. Partly I can answer, and partly maybe I can ask you, Dr. Sebastian, to answer. Um, uh, there is, you know, one of the five uh, pillars on which the National Rural Health Mission uh, stands is community monitoring, and the government has taken it quite seriously and have formed a advisory group uh, that Dr. Sebastian is part of and I am part of. In fact, PFI is the Secretariat for Community Monitoring. And what we have done is to work at different levels with the, with the community, with uh, the village level health sanitation committees, all, all different committees of the community that are part of the health system. And our objective has been to try and strengthen the village health sanitation committees, as well as have village health and sanitation committees, where the membership is from local, you know, the local health, the frontline health workers. Um, membership also includes um, the um, Anganwadi, the 
ICDS workers, the midday meal school uh, providers. It includes um, uh, panchayats, which is the local bodies, the uh, local gum, uh, locally elected representatives. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, 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 given that there is local self-government at this uh, village level in India, I, um, uh, it's a whole process and we'll be very happy to share the information with you. It is going to take time, but the accountability ultimately comes around to the community being more aware of their rights, um, the village health sanitation committees being more aware of the services, and then doing a review of the services that exist. And there are report cards that the villagers make which are put in the village center, center of the village. And uh, we are pushing for greater accountability in terms of redressal mechanisms. Some states have started redressal mechanisms, put them in place. Do you want to add anything to uh, that, Dr. Sudarshan? Fine. Okay, so the second question, who would like to answer on human resources? Um, when Katesh from UNFPA is going to respond to the question of human uh, I think uh, the question that was posed uh, of, uh, uh, on the skewed distribution, is it uh, really you know, the case in India? Yes, it is very much the distribution of human resources is an issue, and skewed distribution is also a major issue with uh, most of the specialist doctors uh, like OBGYN and surgeons, uh, more concentrated in the urban areas. There is a huge uh, effort of the government to enact to earmark funds to hire uh, services of uh, doctors from the private sector. But unfortunately, the amounts that are being paid is not that attractive, so therefore, human resources is uh, an issue. The private sector engagement uh, in providing services, there is provisions, but uh, the potential not very high. There is task shifting efforts to paramedics from the doctors. Uh, there are trainings planned and not uh, many, many number of people trained, but again, the quality of training is something that we need to look at. There are very good initiatives now on improving midwifery uh, you know, skills with uh, the establishment of national and state knowledge centers, but there is a few more years, I think, before you know, all these things were fructified. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to kind of work on uh, community monitoring and accountability. The whole objective is to take public back to public health, and there is, uh, there is, uh, there are programs not only at the national level, but all the states in India, in their project implementation plans, have put community monitoring funds for it as well as planning for it uh, in the recent years. Poonam, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Would you like to invite uh, any members of your general audience to uh, pose some questions to the group? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Questions? Comments? Yeah. It'll take you time to come. By the time you come, we can ask somebody else to. <laughs> Uh, who's coming to you, Ingo? In the meantime, anybody else? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, I'm Indu Kapoor, and I'm a nutritionist, and I was dying to answer that question on nutrition. Actually, in India, nutritionists are not really considered, you know, mainstream in health. In fact, uh, you know, many health people think that nutrition is the issue of women and children, but not related to maternal health. You will be surprised to know, but this is at the top level. And secondly, just counseling on nutrition really can't make much of a difference in the populations we are talking about because they are really poor. And the kind of food prices which are spiraling, I mean, any advice that we give, we have to give with a lot of caution because we know that we are talking to the poorest of the poor and they can't really afford what we are saying. So I would like to go with 
Sudarshan and saying that of course we need to give nutrition counseling and we need to grow biodiversity and everything. But you know that one paisa iron and folic acid tablet probably is a better short term solution. So in the long term we need to do a lot of nutrition initiatives. But you know maternal death and morbidity, the kind it is in India, cannot be overcome in such a short period of time, particularly among the poorest of the poor. Thank you. <coughs> will give um, um, uh, subsidized, very subsidized food grains to the poor, poor and the middle class in India. 70% people are going to get low cost um, uh, 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 subsidy for food grains. So let's see how that impacts. Um, Ab 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 Abhay has yes. a question or a comment? Um, maybe you asked us a very pertinent question as to what next? And I would like to bounce this question back to Washington and Harvard, that after this two-day meeting and this dialogue, what next? <laughs> How will this be used? And what is the proposed next action point program in which we can all work together towards a common agenda? John or Mary, no? Did you want to weigh in on that? Uh, <laughs> Michael, may we jump in at this end? Yes, please do. <laughs> it's a very fair question, Abe. We've had another question come up while we were listening to questions at that end, so I'm sidestepping only for a moment. <laughs> to give the floor to a, an audience member who has a question. Uh, hello, my name is Ann Alston, and I'm with the Maternal Health Task Force at Harvard. And one issue that I didn't hear come up today was referrals. Um, there was information about incentivizing women through JSY to get to facilities. There were mechanisms mentioned briefly to solve about the votes that were trying to get women to services. But what sort of systems are being put in place to increase access to facilities for women who need them during the electric emergency. Um, who'd like to answer the question on <laughs> reference? Uh, reference is a, a major trust uh, in the NRHM and the developing first referral units and also both the uh, secondary developing medical college institutions and uh, the tertiary care. Also in South India, there are um, the purchasing of services uh, from the private sector through health so-called uh, health security or voucher system. Um, the Rajiv Aragashri, the Ashesmini, Vajpa Aragashri, some of these uh, programs are also in doing. So referral cards and the system, it needs to be strengthened, but uh, definitely for the maternal health, emergency obstetric care, the referrals have much now, but much more needs to be done. So should we go back to question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. John is a brave one. He's, he's willing to take it on. I, I could say a few things. I, I think not only for India, but uh, I think where we have you know, national ownership and strong, uh, uh, skilled uh, both providers and analysts, I think we have to make sure that maternal health gets on the post-2015 development agenda. I think clearly that uh, it has to be explicit. Uh, it isn't clear at the moment that universal coverage actually will, will focus on women's, uh, women's health uh, and maternal health and morbidities. Uh, uh, that's the first issue. The second is I think we have to continue to, to look at this in terms of an investment decision. Uh, uh, the, the bank is beginning to do a little more on this. Countries are beginning to think that this is, makes sense. But from the, the World Development Report that looked at the investments in women's health uh, as, a, as, a, as a sound investment strategy for development, I think we have to make that known to, to finance ministers, to state governments, uh, to make sure that, that they're making investments that are, that are consistent with the evidence. 
Uh, at the third uh, level, I think we have to still look for innovations. I mean, India is a great place for innovations, looking at how we address some of these issues that are, that are common in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and uh, and our emerging in marginalized populations in in, in uh, uh, East Asia and South South uh, America, I think we have to begin to look at how do we how do we begin to segment markets, make sure that we understand what those markets are. We we don't really deal well with markets in terms of family planning. I don't think we even think about it in terms of maternal health. Uh, uh, and thinking about in the future, how do we begin to finance these issues and how do people contribute uh, both to the, the cost of their care but also reap the benefits of those investments? Uh, I think uh, we have to keep uh, uh, policymakers the, their feet to the fire on this. Uh, I don't think we should be timid. Uh, this is a time when there are lots of interest in, in non-communicable diseases and all kinds of other priorities that are up there. Uh, if, we, if we want women in health to be uh, central for the, on the development agenda, we have to continue to speak with a strong and vibrant voice. Great. Thank you. Um, um, I hope you're making a commitment on behalf of at least the population council. Avina Sarna is there in the audience. I think... Uh, <laughs> You will work with her and she will make sure to remind you that Pop Council and I hope that when we meet on 25th May there is a meeting uh, uh, there is a meeting that CCI WWICI uh, is doing in um, Washington and one of the objectives is to share the findings of the meeting that you had in Africa and the current one in India, am I right? Um, June, June 25th. So I, we are hoping and expecting mm -hmm. that they will be sharing of the findings on June 25th. And secondly, we have been thinking a lot as the moderators met today and PFI has been thinking about how we can effectively take the recommendations both at the national policy level and international with donors. We had very good participation of donors in the meeting yesterday and we will be working on finalizing the recommendations and putting, doing some both social media and working with the media too on bringing out um, the findings that we do expect that the government of India will be given the, the the composition of the group we had yesterday, some of the leaders who the government has on various committees in any case, uh, and people who from outside the government engage in uh, making public policy in India, including the three people sitting on my left and right on this table and several people in the audience that we will collectively and individually work with the government on influencing policy. It's like a, it's been like a consensus document, I feel, that there were several yeah. issues, there was huge consensus on. So we do intend to take that forward and we hope that the three organizations there will also take this forward. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Punam. Unfortunately, it's it's coming up to 11 and 8.30, and uh, so we're going to have to wrap up. Let me just say that this was truly a, a very remarkable uh, conference from a substantive uh, point of view, certainly, also from a technological uh, perspective. What we heard uh, was really, I think, realistic, but also uh, hopeful, and I think we've heard some, some very uh, actionable recommendations uh, for policy, which are particularly relevant uh, here uh, in Washington. In a moment, I'll, I'll invite uh, Mary Nell and Punam, if they like, to offer 60-second closing remarks. But if I could just have very a very quick three-way uh, trans-oceanic round of applause for all of our presenters today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mary Nell, did you want to uh, offer any closing remarks? Um, mostly a note of appreciation. I, I, before I say a few thank yous, I want to underline what John just mentioned about accountability and economic development. I think we are all accountable to making sure maternal health and especially maternal mortality and morbidity as well as newborn mortality and morbidity do not slip off this next set of development goals. 
So in the conversations and discussions and meetings we're in, I think it's up to all of us to continue to talk about these issues and push for them. I also wanted to thank Dr. Sanjay for his comments and to note the importance of the media and sharing information. We at the Maternal Health Task Force have a website that we are happy to share. We work a lot in social media and we are in the process of constructing an India country page. So if any of you in India or elsewhere for that matter have papers or communications, programs, agendas, findings, analysis, blog posts, mm -hmm. anything that you would like to share, please don't be shy about contacting us. We're happy to work with you to get it up on our website and hopefully to extend a more global reach to whatever the information is that we feel and you feel is important to share. And finally, I just want to say a hearty thank you especially to all of you in India for staying up with us. We've really enjoyed the opportunity to take part in this discussion and appreciate PFI and appreciate the Woodrow Wilson Center for being such valued partners. So good night to those of you in India and, and goodbye to those in Washington. Thanks again from all of us here at the Harvard School of Public Health. And Poonam, before we turn off the lights, any uh, final word? Yeah. and collaborating with us. Uh, it was, we, we've taken full advantage uh, of uh, planning a future agenda in India. And um, John, it's great to see you on, 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 on the video camera <laughs> and everybody else, but I haven't seen John for several years, and so it's good to reunite uh, with you. And I want to thank the panelists uh, who have stayed with us from yesterday morning um, uh, uh, working very hard and giving us a lot of their valuable time. I want to thank the group here uh, who are uh, with us for giving up their evening and being with us through this discussion. And uh, I particularly want to thank uh, UNFPA for all the collaboration and help we've received in India, apart from the international funding. Uh, I want to thank Francesca, my colleague Francesca Barolo Shergil, who has single-handedly actually planned and led this um, uh, meeting, planning for this meeting, and other colleagues who helped her. So with that, I want to thank you all and say good night on everybody's behalf. Yes, thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. It's always nice to join the 22nd century, 21st century, I guess. Uh, thank you all. From the, on behalf of the Wilson Center, uh, the Global Health Initiative, uh, the Asia Program, thank you all. And we are now adjourned. That's great. Mary Nell looked like a CNN anchor, didn't yeah. she? <laughs> With Harvard School of Public Health. She's... <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.